We're full of technical difficulty this morning. Thank you for bearing with us. Good morning. If you're visiting with us this morning, my name is Kyle, and it is my privilege to be one of the ministers here at the Pastor Panjang Church of Christ. And we are in a series on being restored for restoration. And what that means is that throughout the story of Scripture, we believe that God has been working to make things right ever since the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden. And God does that by restoring through his people from Abraham and Moses and Israel all the way through until he brings the perfect form of restoration in Jesus Christ. And Jesus comes to show us what it means not just to be compassionate for the broken as we studied in our previous series, but also what it means to live the good life, the life that is full of healing and grace and forgiveness. And Jesus brings us that by showing us that Everything is being restored, and it starts with him at the cross and also through his resurrection, where he even overcomes death. And so he invites us as people who are restored through him, we're restored into God's image by the blood of Christ, and we too are chosen to make things right in this world. And so we're looking at different stories of where Jesus has shown his resurrected self to his disciples, and he's decided to show them what it means to make things right in this world. And often it comes with some sort of commission. We looked at that with Mary Magdalene as she saw the risen Christ. And what was the first thing that Jesus said? Don't cling to me, but go and tell my brothers. It always comes with a mission to make things right. And so this morning, as we look at another instance, I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to the gospel account of John. And in John chapter 21, we'll continue on with another episode of Jesus appearing to a disciple. John chapter 21, starting from verse 15 until verse 19. John 21 from verse 15 until verse 19. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. And he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Now, Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands And another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Let's all pray together. Father, we love you and your son Jesus. And we recognize the new thing that you are doing in your son Jesus Christ. How you have conquered sin through forgiveness, and you've conquered death through resurrection. You invite us to be restored people. So, Father, as we meditate on what it means to be restored through forgiveness today, I ask that you will pour through me me, the gift of story, of preaching, and imagination, that our eyes may be open to the forgiveness that you offer, that we may see how we are indeed a new creation. We pray all this by the power of your Spirit and through the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. There's this scene in the story of the Iliad, the famous Greek story by the poet Homer, where he talks about the hero Achilles. And the hero Achilles has sailed with the armies of Greece, and they've sailed across the sea to Troy, where they've got it under siege, and they're fighting in battle. And the uh, the hero Achilles is invincible, with the exception of one thing. And you know what that is, right? His... Achilles heel. That's why we call it our Achilles. The Achilles heel for him was his weakness. But in this moment, he stood on the beach with the rest of the army, ready to fight more in the battle. But he had a decision to make. And as he looked out, 
He considered where he had just been. He looked out over the sea as he stood on the beach. And he said, I carry two sorts of destiny today in my hand uh, and and the day of my death. Either I stay here and I fight, and I fight against the city of the Trojans, and my return home is gone, but my glory shall be everlasting. And he says, but if I return home to the beloved land of my fathers, the excellence of my glory is gone. But there will, be no long li- there will be nothing but a long life left for me. And in the end, my death will not come quickly. And so in this moment, he chose, will I choose to sacrifice my life for the sake of glory? Or will I return home and live in peace and live out my days and become an old man and die without any glory? And of course, for many of us, we know this story, and whether you studied it in school or you saw Brad Pitt play in this film several, uh, several years ago, we know what Achilles does. He goes and he chooses to die an early death in glory in a bloody and vicious battle. Now, I'm not here to condone violence or battles, but I will say that in this moment, he had a choice to make. Standing on that beach, Achilles had to choose his form of glory. What would he take? And it's in this moment that that many biblical scholars take a look and they say, Peter, standing here on this beach in John chapter 21, is very similar to Achilles. He has an Achilles moment where he has a choice to make between what form of glory will he choose? Will he choose to stay and be a fisherman the rest of his days? Or will he choose to sacrifice his life early and follow Jesus? And that's the moment that we find ourselves in, in John chapter 21 and verse 15. Because if we look at the context of this story, we see that just a few, pa- a few verses before, something has been happening. And it's something that's very familiar, both in the Gospel of John and throughout the accounts of the Gospels. Because we see that Jesus has, has appeared to the disciples He's appeared to Mary. He's appeared to the disciples. He appeared to Thomas, as John shared with us last week. And then he just seems to disappear. He keeps coming and going, coming and going. Where, what is Jesus up to? And then Peter's standing around. He's waiting for instruction. He's waiting for Jesus to appear, and he gets tired of waiting. You ever get tired of waiting? Man, I do all the time. I got tired of waiting for my ride this morning. But do I get tired of waiting for the bus? Yes, sometimes. I get tired of waiting for the train. I get tired of waiting for my ro- ride. Peter gets tired of waiting. So what does he do? You look there in the passage, in the context of the passage in chapter 21, after Jesus has revealed himself, Peter gets tired and he says, let's go fishing. Let's go back to, let's go back to what we know. And so a handful of the disciples, most likely the ones that were fishermen before that Jesus called, they go back. They go back to Galilee. They go back to the place of their fathers. They go back to their old boats. They go back to their nets. They open up shop again. They're going back for business. And it's in that moment that another miracle happens. And you know the story, right? Right? They're going and they're fishing again. And then all of a sudden, in the morning, they see a vision of somebody on the seashore. Man, this is all so familiar. It's like deja vu for these disciples because it's like... I, I, I know I've been here before, right? And what, is the, and what does the figure on the side of the beach say? He says, well, why don't you cast your net on the other side? And in that moment, they recognize. And John says, it's the Lord. Because he's, he's already done this before. He was there at the beginning and he told us to do that. And, he, and, and it worked and it sank our boats. And there were so many fish before last time. And he's going to tell us to do it again. Wow, it's him. And so Peter, he, he jumps into the water and he goes and he swims to him. And they're just in awe. Because they're here back at Galilee, and it's like they're reliving this whole amazing experience. The whole thing that, that, that just brought them to these three years of wonderful, life-changing experience and ministry with Jesus. And, they, and here he is again, back on the sea, sea, seashore, standing at the Sea of Galilee. And so they get out, and they look, and even John records 153 fish to be very specific, to let them know, wow, this, is, this really happened. And they have all this count, a catch of fish, and so they sit there and they eat breakfast together. And you can imagine the dumbfounded looks on the, on the apostles' faces as they're sitting there cooking fish or preparing it, sitting there together. It's like, is it really him? He's here. We saw him before, but we thought maybe it's just a vision, an apparition. But he's here in the flesh, and he's, and he's eating fish with us. He's having breakfast with us. And they couldn't believe it. And they're just in awe. So they just marvel as Jesus breaks bread and has fish and gives it to them. And even in that, 
The breaking of loaves and fish, isn't that familiar too? The feeding of the multitudes, wow, it just keeps going on and on. So amazing. And so in this story, we find they've eaten breakfast together, full bellies, and Jesus leans over and he looks at Peter and he asks him this question. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Three times. Three times he asks him. And he actually uses two different words. He uses for the word love, do you love me? The first two times he says, do you agape me? And then the thought last one, he says, do you phileo me? Do, do you even consider yourself my friend? Do you consider yourself my bosom buddy, my, my pal, my mate? He asked him this question three times. And all three times, Peter gives the same answer. Yes, Lord, you know I do. And what's Jesus' response? Feed my lambs. Tend my sheep. Feed my sheep. All some variation of taking care of sheep and lambs. What is that about? This is a fisherman. And now you want him to become a shepherd? This is a change of career. He's going to have to go back and take some upskilling classes. Learn how to do this. But this is what Jesus calls him to. What does it mean? What is Jesus inviting him to? I think it's interesting that Jesus calls him by his name because, you know, in other places, when, Jesus, when Peter makes this confession, you are the Christ, you're the son of the living God. What, is, what does Jesus say? He says, your name is Peter, little rock. And on this rock, this foundation, this confession, I'm going to build my church, right? So usually this guy goes by his nickname, the rock, right? But here, Jesus doesn't call him rock. He doesn't call him Peter. He calls him by his given name, the name of his birth. What does that mean? I know what it means for me when somebody calls me by my full name, and it was usually my mother. And it was usually because she was being very serious about something. Now, some of you might not know, but I actually go by my middle name. My full name is Dennis Kyle Hooper. I go by Kyle. And that's what they've always called me. So I'm actually, there's another Dennis here. So there's multiple Dennises. But when I heard that, when I heard Dennis Kyle Hooper, I knew something was up and I better pay attention, right? I could have been off doing anything, but I heard all three of my names. I know I better pay attention. And I wonder if Jesus is, number one, he could be just trying to get Peter's attention and saying, hey, this is serious. What I'm about to ask you is a serious question. But it could also be that he's going back to the beginning. He's going back and getting a fresh start. Let's get past that part that where I saw you last. Remember where they met each other last? It was in the night of Jesus' arrest. In the betrayal and the arrest. And what happened with Peter in that night? Three times. I don't know this man. I've never been with him. Yeah, but, but wait, you, you speak with a Galilean accent. We, I, I've seen you with some of his, of, of his other buddies. No, 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 no. And he denied Jesus three times. That was the last encounter they had. And here, Jesus is calling him by his given name. Let's go back to the beginning. Let's have a new start. It's interesting, though, that Peter also gets his feelings hurt. By the third question, by the third time Jesus asked the question, he says, he was offended. Like, he was hurt, hurt. He had hurt feelings that Jesus would ask him three times, don't you already know me, Lord? I, I just jumped out of a boat to swim to eat breakfast with you. Of course I love you. Of course I do. He has hurt feelings. You ever have somebody ask you if you, if you love them? Now, this is a sensitive topic, especially for husbands and wives, right? Wives like to hear that their husbands love them, right? And then there's that old joke about, you know, the, the old joke about the husband and the wife, right? The, the wife said, do you love me? And he's like, well, you know I love you. Why don't you tell me that you love me? I want to hear it, right? I want to hear it like when we first fell in love. And what's his response? Well, I told you on the day that we got married that I loved you. And if I change my mind, I'll let you know, <laughs> right? That's how, that's how it is. It's like, we, but we like to hear it. We want to hear it. We want it, we want it to be reinforced. And so Peter's really offended by this. 
I don't know if it's just the man in him that he feels like, well, I haven't changed my position, so what would make you think that I don't? But he's offended. But notice that Jesus doesn't, Jesus doesn't take umbrage. Jesus doesn't get offended back at Peter's defensiveness. He simply moves on. And I think there's something special in that, this idea of how Jesus responds to Peter's defensiveness. He doesn't require any kind of formal apology from Peter. They have a history, and it's a painful history. Because we've talked about what is it like for, Peter, for Jesus to be betrayed by one of his closest friends. He's never, in the accounts of the script, of gospel, we've never seen and this thing resolved. Jesus doesn't come and say, hey, we need to talk about that time that you denied me three times. This is all we get. And I think that's because that's all there was. I don't think they had any other conversation. In fact, the three times Jesus is asking this is kind of like giving Peter three times to fix the situation. And Jesus is offering forgiveness before Peter even comes to apologize because we don't read anywhere where Peter says, Lord, I'm so sorry that I denied your name. That's not in the Bible. And yet Jesus extends forgiveness. What does that say about Jesus and forgiveness? Because I feel like sometimes I live in a place where I have to apologize for forgiveness to be given to me. And things won't be right until I make the first move as the offender. But that's not true in the world of Jesus. Jesus is offering forgiveness already. What does that say about Jesus? What does that say about us? And then he ends this conversation talking about feeding lambs and feeding sheep. Take care of these. And it makes me wonder, because the question was, do you love me more than these? Well, who are the these? Is it the fish? Do you love me more than fishing? Do you love me more than the occupation? Or do you love me more than the other disciples love me? What's the question here? It's, it's vague. It's not clear. And I've studied this a long time, and I still don't have a good answer on that. But I do know that that's not what's so important. What is important is the next move. Jesus says, basically, if you love me, feed my sheep. Take care of my lambs. Take care of my sheep, my flock. What's the implication here? The implication is that Peter is being called to something more. It's not just enough for him to be forgiven. He needs to do something with his restored position as one of Jesus' closest disciples. He has a responsibility to take care of other people. He can't just go and do what he wants. And so I find it really interesting that Jesus kind of concludes this with kind of a little bit of a proverb. And John says it's actually a prophecy about how Peter's going to die. Because he says, when you were young, you were, used to dress yourself however you wanted, and you went wherever you wanted to. And isn't that true about us? When we're young, who's the most important person in the world? Me, right? And part of that is by default. Part of that is our wiring, our firmware. As babies, it's all about self-preservation. We cry as little children, as infants, because we have needs. And it's all about us. I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. I'm wet. I'm tired. As a baby, that's all I can focus on. But as we grow up, we learn that becoming a human, an adult human, is more about letting go of myself and my needs and taking care of the needs of others. And sometimes that comes at a cost. Sometimes that requires me to give up the thing that I want to do to dress how I want to dress and go where I want to go for the sake of somebody else. And I know that John says this is to indicate what kind of death Peter would have. And tradition tells us that Peter was crucified but because he didn't want to be equated with his master, he chose to be crucified upside down. That's the tradition. And so he was hung, he was hanged upside down on a cross. And so that's what John indicates. That's what he was talking about. It was a reference to that. But I wonder if there's more to that. That if this message is about maturing as a follower of Jesus and saying, it's not about me anymore and what I want to do, but it's about letting go of that and going where I don't want to go but maybe that's where God's spirit is calling me. And so Jesus concludes by those two famous words that he started his relationship with all the disciples with. Follow me. Come follow me. And that's how he ends this interaction. 
In essence, Peter receives forgiveness. And he also gets given a commission to take care of other people. And he's also being challenged to grow up and quit worrying about yourself. Look to the needs of other people. What does that mean for you and me? I think it means three things. The first is that Jesus restores through his forgiveness, not through my apology. I think there's something here because Jesus, Peter is right when he says, Lord, you know everything. And we all agree. Jesus knows our hearts, right? Jesus knows my heart. He knows your heart. He knows when I'm authentic, when I intentionally want to do what's right. And yet, he doesn't demand formal apologies from us or recompense that we have to make things right. Now, that's not to overlook confession and our repentance because we do need to change our behavior. So it's not to overlook that. But what I'm saying is Jesus offers forgiveness in our relationships. It's not transactional. Forgiveness is not transactional. I will be angry with you until you come and apologize to me. I know people like that, don't you? In fact, that's the way the world works. Forgiveness is merit-based. You must earn your forgiveness. But that's not what Jesus teaches here. Because he never asks for an apology. He's extending forgiveness. He's extending restoration of this relationship already. We're made whole by his forgiveness. Not by our merit. He, puts, he forgives us and he restores us. Why does he do that? Because he loves us. He wants to be in relationship with us, but he wants so much more. It's not just to get us right, to get us holy, to get us to where we can go to heaven. He gives us another reason that he restores us. So he forgives us so that we can do something else. And that's the second thing that I want to share with you. Jesus restores you and me so that we can serve other people. You see, my love for Jesus calls me to feed the flock, to tend and feed the sheep. And it's not just Peter because he's one of the, the, the closest disciples of Jesus, Peter, James, and John. It's not just because he's one of the 12. It's because he's a follower of Jesus, period. And it's the same for you and me. I'm called to feed the sheep, not because I'm called into ministry, but because I'm a follower of Jesus. And the same goes for you. Jesus calls you and forgives you so that you can serve others, so that you can serve the flock, so that you can feed and take care of the flock. We're in this together. And Jesus says, that's your commission. I forgive you not just so that you can get a ticket to heaven. It's so that you can take care of everybody else in my name and by my spirit. You see, I'm made whole not for my own glory, but so that I can glorify God through my service to others. That's, that's for you and me. Not just to the special privilege that are called, but for everybody that says, I want to follow Jesus. So I can glorify God through my service. And that leads us to the last one. Jesus restores us so that we can glorify him. See, he invites me to surrender my will and to follow him. Just like he told Peter, when you were young, you used to dress how you wanted to. You'd put on your own belt and you'd go where you wanted to go. But when you get old, other people will do that and they will take you where you don't want to go. What if the other people are not just the ones that are leading Peter to his death, but what if it's being led by the Spirit to the places we don't want to go? Nine years ago, my wife and I were called to Cambodia. I wouldn't say that's where I wanted to go. If you've been to Cambodia, there's some nice touristy things to do there. But for living day in and day out for seven years, that's not ideal. There's better places in the world to choose a life for your family. We went where we didn't want to go. And I don't say that to puff myself up. I say that to say, if I'm going to glorify God, I have to go maybe where he wants me to go, but I don't want to go. And if I'm being led by his spirit, I go because I want to glorify him so that I can glorify him. We're made whole, not because we do what we want or we receive forgiveness for our own sake, but it's so that we can glorify God. We can be the best version of ourselves, the best form of humanity. The best form of humanity isn't self-seeking. It loves others. 
It's mature. It's the one that lays down my own will for the sake of other people. What is it that Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13? He says, when I was a child, I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. I behaved like a child. But when I became mature, when I grew up, I put those childish things away. And I think that's what Jesus is telling Peter. You need to quit going back to fishing. You need to grow up and you need to take care of other people. And he's saying it in not so many words and probably a little bit nicer. But some of us need to hear it in that harsh way. And we need to recognize we need to grow up. Some of us have been Christians for far too long to not be serving other people. We've only been serving ourselves. Jesus calls us to restoration, not just so we can get to heaven, but so that we can glorify him. Even if it means being, having a belt put on us and led where we don't want to go. That's the glory that he invites us to. That's the restoration that he offers us through forgiveness. Which brings me back to Achilles. You remember Achilles was choosing between two forms of glory. What would he do? He chose to lay down his life for the sake of that glory. That was a very selfish and vain glory in that story, right? But Peter's invited to a glory by laying down his life, but it's not his own glory, is it? It's the glory of Jesus Christ. And so you and I, we're just like Achilles on that beach. We're just like Peter on that beach. Jesus offers us forgiveness so that we can serve others and glorify him. A famous theologian from Germany, his name was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He lived during the Third Reich and during World War II. And in fact, he was imprisoned because he was accused of espionage and of a plot to, to betray and overthrow Hitler. And he wrote many things before that time, but also while he was in prison. And one of his most famous books is called The Cost of Discipleship. And he very succinctly says this thing, and I love how he says it. I like a lot of the things that Bonhoeffer said. But he said, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. And isn't that what Jesus calls us to do? To take up our cross and follow him daily. Jesus offers us glory, not for ourselves, but glory that goes to the Father. And so today, you and I are like Achilles. We have this moment to choose. Which will we choose? Will you choose glory for yourself? Or will you choose the forgiveness that you receive in Jesus to serve others and in turn give God all the glory? The choice is ours and we must choose which we will make today. Won't you make that choice this morning as we stand and sing together? No, Rob.